Let me begin. So, um, right, so, um, second lecture of the series. Uh, so, last time I told you about the hyperbolic plane and uh, its geometry. So, today I'm going to um, talk about Fuchsian groups. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the task for today. Um, so as, as a motivation, let me just recall some construction that you already know. Something that you might have seen um, recently. So if you look at Z plus Z, this group acts on the complex plane by translations, okay? Um, so if you take, for example, the two translations, z going to z plus 1 and z going to z plus i, so these, both of these are automorphisms of the complex plane. Um, and so, and you can look at the group generated by them, of, as, as we've seen last time. And compositions of automorphisms are automorphisms, and so on. So you can look at the group generated by these two. This turns out to be Z plus Z, because these commute. Okay? Um, and this now acts on the complex plane. What does the picture look like? This is something you might have seen before. Um, so you have... So on the complex plane, these horizontal and vertical lines are left invariant under this, under these um, elements and under this action. And so, so what does the translation by one do? It just it shifts right this way, and translation by i shifts vertically. And you can look at the quotient map, right? So the um, so you can look at c quotiented with this z plus z. Subgroup. Uh, this this is a subgroup of the automorphisms of the complex plane. Um, and what does this quotient mean? Well, every orbit uh, identified to a point, and and you know that what you get. You here you get a torus, right? So that that's what this uh, uh, quotient map construction is that you've seen uh, before. And in fact, these uh, horizontal and vertical lines which are left invariant by the action, these give you two curves, right, on, on, the, on the torus, okay? They intersect once. Okay, so this you are familiar with. So uh, a Fuchsian group um, is going to be um, a similar thing, but instead of the complex plane, we'll take, a hyperbolic, uh, take the hyperbolic plane that we saw before. So it's going to be a subgroup of the automorphisms, automorphism group of hyperbolic plane, which is this uh, group of two by two matrices, PSL2R, and this will acts on, so these groups, uh, Fuchsian groups will act on the hyperbolic plane, and we are going to get a picture which is analogous to this one, so what's going to be picture here is, let's say, the disk model, and so there's going to be some kind of, just like here, we have some kind of tiling of the complex plane by these, these squares, okay? So, um, so here there'll be a tiling with, with polygons. So this is just a schematic, okay? So I'm sure you could, if you Google, you'll find better pictures of these. And, this, and as a quotient, you might get a genus 2 surface. Okay, or, or higher genus. So this is the goal for, so I'm going to, um, so this is the goal for today. Um, so I'm, so we'll try to get to this picture. Okay, so I will try to get to, to define some subgroup of these automorphism group, of P, subgroup of PSL2R that acts and you have some kind of tiling of the hyperbolic plane and then the quotient you get the genus G surface where G is bigger than or equal to two. Okay, so um, so that's what a Fuchsian group is is good for. 
Um, so before I can you know, define a Fuchsian group, let me tell you a little bit more about, about automorphisms of H2, these PSL2R. Remember, these were linear fractional transformations. Okay, so so the, this has a classification, the classification of elements into types, um, which is going to be useful. So classification of elements of PSL2R, which is automorphisms of H2. Um, so, so there are a few types. So, so the theorem is that any element, let's call it A, in PSL2R, I'm al always going to think of this as PSL2R, that, that matrix as, as a map of the upper half plane to itself, right? So it's, a, um, it's an automorphism. Uh, is either, so there's a few choices as well, it's either the identity element, okay, so that's, that's a possibility, it's, that certainly is an automorphism, um, so, so that's just the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, or it's uh, an elliptic element, okay, so this, um, this is some terminology that I'll, I'll come to a bit later why we call these um, elliptic. Um, so it's elliptic, which means that it has um, one fixed point in H2. Remember again that it's a map from H2 to H2, right? And so if it has one fixed point, we call it an elliptic element. Um, and, and in these cases, in fact, the trace is uh, less than two. The, the size of the tr so trace of the two by two matrix is some real number here, the size of which is between minus two and two. Or, so that's one possibility. Or it could be a parabolic element, so in which case it has um, two fixed points. Sorry, uh, it's, it's one fixed point in the boundary, okay, um, and, and so I'll, I'll come to some examples of these uh, in a bit, and the trace is equal to two, and the final possibility is uh, it's a hyperbolic, what is called a hyperbolic element, um, where it has two fixed points in the boundary. Okay, um, and, and in this case, the size of the trace is bigger than two. Okay, so, so these are all the possibilities because, I mean, if, if, I mean, A, so this is my map, which, remember, it looks like AZ plus B upon CZ plus D, right? So if this has um, three fixed points, right, and, and um, in the, in, let's say in H2 or its closure in the boundary. Um, so then this implies that A must be identity, right? So because um, what, what's a fixed point? Well, AZ plus B upon CZ plus D must equal Z, right? Only then is that point fixed. But if you try to solve this equation, it's a quadratic um, polynomial here, right? So, um, so you get, uh, get solutions, which I mean, you either get um, so you might have a, a repeated route in which, um, yeah, so, or you might have two, right? So, so, so if you work out the possibilities, uh, then you will see that these are the only possibilities. Okay, so, um, and A plus D is this trace which I've written down uh, here, right? So, so what are examples of, of all of these? Yeah, so for example, what are examples of each of these uh, kinds of automorphisms? So, um, so the first, so the elliptic um, case is sort of best viewed in the Poincare disk model. So here in the Poincare disk model, if you look at the rotation, Z goes to E to the I theta Z, right? So, um, the rotation by angle theta. This 
is an automorphism, right? So um, it's clearly an automorphism. And, um, so this is uh, an elliptic element. So this, in, uh, let me just say, in the Poincare disk model. Okay, so in the disk model for the hi hyperbolic plane. All right, so that's an example of an elliptic um, isometry. And in fact, so um, you can, so this one fixed point, you can always sort of conjugate so that it is at the center zero. So, so anything, any elliptic element is in, of this form up to conjugation, okay? Um, the second, let's say, the, uh, the parabolic case, what's the example to have in mind? So, so this is going to be best viewed in the upper half plane. And it's just the translation on the upper half plane, z goes to z plus 1. Okay, so, so here these vertical geodesics are distance 1 apart, are taken 1 to, to the other, right? So every point here is, so jumps to the right distance. Well, so by, by, um, by this coordinate, the y coordinate remains the same, but the x coordinate increases by 1. Um, as a matrix, what does this look like? Well, it's 1, 1, 0, 1, right? Um, so that, that is trace equal to 2. Uh, this is an example of a parabolic um, automorphism, right? Para parabolic isometry. Um, so, so you can see that this has no fixed points in the interior of the hyperbolic plane, but there's one fixed point in the boundary, namely infinity, right? So, so this is indeed something of this form. And once again, just like before, does this, any parabolic um, automorphism has a fixed point, and you can conjugate that to be infinity in this upper half plane model. So any parabolic um, uh, transformation you can conjugate to be of this form. Maybe this, you, can, you should allow yourselves a little bit of freedom. You can translate by any number, which will show up here. And it's, so it's always conjugate to something of this form, okay? Um, all right, so, and, and the third example of a hyperbolic isometry, um, a hyperbolic transformation. So, so this would now have, so what does that look like? So let me, um, so the hyperbolic case, uh, again in the upper half plane model, this looks like z goes to lambda squared z, or in terms, if you prefer matrices, this would look like where lambda is some real number bigger than zero. Okay, so this is this is certainly an element of PSL2R, right? Is it? Um, and as if you convert it to linear fractional transformation, this is what it does. Now this. As you can see, it, it dilates, right? So it fixes zero and fixes infinity. These are two points on the boundary, okay? And everything else moves, it sort of scales. So anything, so all these lines that I'm drawing through the origin are, are preserved and it kind of scales this whole, all, all this, this picture, right? So, so in particular, so remember that semicircles, which are orthogonal to the boundary, are geodesics, this geodesic is sent to this geodesic and so on, right? So there's some kind of, um, so this, this picture here, okay? Um, and, and once again, so uh, hy any hyperbolic transformation, you can conjugate so that these two fixed points are, are actually zero and infinity. So the element does look like this, okay? The upper half plane, all right? Um, all right, so, so and here you can see that the trace is, is bigger than two, okay? Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, that is sort of, uh, yeah, I'll leave that to people to work out, yeah. Um, right, so, so as I said, the rotational symmetry is, is best viewed in, in, in the Poincare disk model. But you can, you can imagine, you, it's the last time I told you how to go back and forth between the upper half plane model and the disk model. So you can work out what this rotation looks like in the upper half plane model. Okay, so, okay. Um, yeah, by the way, so this, uh, so why are these called 
uh, elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic. That is to do with the hyperboloid model that we've seen before. So elliptic elements, so there's a reason for this terminology. So elliptic elements preserve um, an ellipse, um, preserve ellipses in the hyperboloid model. That's and, and parabolic elements preserve parabolas um, and hyperbolic. Um, any guesses? Okay. Hyperbolas, right? Okay. So, um, and you can see this. Uh, so, what was the hyperboloid model? It was something like this in in uh, R3 with this um, pseudo-Riemannian metric of um, signature 2, 1. And um, so if you, if, you, if you cut this hyperboloid with a plane, um, then, so a plane like this, then it'll, it'll cut an ellipse. Okay, so, and, and so, I, so I kind of described how to go back and forth between the disk model and the hyperboloid model. And using this, you can... Yeah, you can figure out um, that. So if you have an elliptic element, let's say it preserves, it fixes zero, like in our case, then so if you take this plane, which is cutting, which is parallel to the x1, x2 uh, plane, it will cut this hyperboloid in an ellipse. And this, and this rotation, this elliptic element, will preserve these intersections. Okay, so this, and, and, and similarly, these, these parabolic elements preserve parabolas and hyperbolic elements that preserve hyperbolic. These hyperbolic translations, these, these hyperbolic elements were the boosts in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in this hyperboloid model that we wrote down last time. Okay, so anyway, so this is just a, a comment on why we call these um, what we call them. So, um, so once we know this, let me now kind of come to... Um, so, a Fuchsian group, gamma, is a discrete subgroup of PSL2R, which, once again, it's the, it's the group of automorphisms of the upper half plane. Okay, so... Um, and, and what does discrete mean? So discrete means uh, it's discrete in the topology. So so these are two by two matrices. So so you it requires a topology um, because you know what convergence of, of numbers, the real numbers, which are the components of the ma matrix are. Um, and and so this gamma is a subgroup, and it requires a topology. And in that topology, it should be discrete. So if there's a sequence of elements, let's call them A n in gamma, such that gamma n converges to the identity, right, as n comes to infinity, then you want, then the, these must equal identity for all large n, right? That's what discrete would mean, right? So, um, and it's enough to see, show that the identity element is isolated because you can translate everywhere else. So that's what discrete uh, means. Um, what's a non-example? So what is not a Fuchsian group? So a non-example is uh, something like this. So if you take irrational rotations, so if you look at the disk model and you look at the group generated by um, two pi i alpha, let's say, times z, uh, where alpha is irrational. Um, so then this group is isomorphic to Z. Okay, so this it doesn't you, no power of this element is equal to identity. Okay, but you know how it acts. So this sort of it rotates, but it, but it doesn't quite come back to where to the identity, but um, almost. And it's sort of and if you take an orbit, the orbits become sort of dense on the circle, right? So, um, so you know how 
the, these irrational rotation acts. And this is not uh, uh, a discrete group, right? So, um, so you get arbitrarily close to the identity element. Okay, so, so as you, you take powers of this, you get arbitrary close. So this is a non-example. Um, um, so what, what is an example? So, so let's, let's just... Well, so we have some examples already on the board. So let me just... So examples, so, so if you look at the group, again, it's a cyclic group with Z, which is generated by a parabolic element, right? So if you look at um, this, look at a parabolic element, and you look at the powers of that, you know, compositions of that with itself. So this would generate a, a cyclic, infinite cyclic subgroup uh, of um, PSL2R, and, and this would be a discrete, um, discrete subgroup. This would be a Fuchsian group. Similarly, if you look at a hyperbolic element, and you look at its translates, so this is a Example of a Fuchsian group. I'll come to uh, sort of why this is so in a, in a little bit. Another example is uh, the group PSL2Z. So if you look at integer matrices which have determinant one, right, and um, up to this um, sort of projectivizing. So if you don't you don't care uh, whether um, so it's like a quotient with plus or minus i. So this is a discrete subgroup, again, of PSL2R. So, and this is a Fuchsian group. So all of these are examples of Fuchsian groups. How can you tell a Fuchsian group if you see one? Well, so, what's going to be important for us is a Fuchsian group acts nicely on um, the upper half plane, or the hyperbolic plane. So, um, so gamma, PSL2R is a Fuchsian group if and only if um, the action of gamma, so gamma acts what is known as properly discontinuous. Um, on the hyperbol on the upper half plane, on the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so if you, yeah, so this is one way of, of telling when a, a group is a Fuchsian. Um, so where, where is, let, let me just say what properly discontinuously means. So, so acting properly discontinuously means, um, so it's like a, it's a somewhat clumsy terminology, but it, so one way of, one equivalent way of, um, of phrasing it would, is the following, that uh, if you look at any orbit, uh, then this orbit is discrete. So it means if you take um, any point in the upper half plane, and um, K, upper half plane, a compact set, Okay, so then um, this orbit gamma of Z, which means that you look at, um, so, uh, so you apply um, all elements of gamma to Z, right? And look at, look at where it goes, right? So this intersected with K is a finite set. Okay, so certainly this is not true for these rotations, right? So... So these rotations, if you look at a point Z and you look at irrational rotations, then you know, for infinitely many of these powers, it will come back arbitrarily close to Z, right? So, so if you look at the compact subset here, perhaps, or maybe even like a big disk here, so you'll get infinitely many points in the orbit over here, okay? So that's not allowed in a, or a, Fuchs, a Fuchsian group or, or a properly discontinuous action. Um, certainly, it's, so if you look at a parabolic element and look at its iterates, its powers, then, then this is true, right? So if you take any compact subset, and so if you take any orbit, 
This orbit is going to just hit it only finitely many times before it just travels away, right? And, and the same happens for a hyperbolic transformation. So um, if you take a compact set, it's, it's, it's dilating, so the point will kind of maybe stay in it here for a few iterates and then sort of it escapes, any orbit escapes, right? So, so that's, that's why these are, if you believe this theorem, this is, um, these are all, these are Fuchsian groups, okay? So um, it acts properly discontinuously. So what's the proof of this? Um, so let's just, not just believe it, but let's try to, um, but so, so the proof of the, this characterization of, of Hooksian groups that I have on the, the right. Well, so in one direction it's, it's easy, so, which means that there exists some ANs in gamma such that ANs do converge to the identity element and um, none of them are identity element, the identity element, right? So this is what it means for a, so this um, group to be not discrete, okay? So, um, so then what happens then, well, so then if you take any orbit, let's pick a point, okay? So then this an applied to z would converge to z, right? And, and you immediately see that this orbit um, is sort of is intersecting a compact set. If you take a neighborhood, a compact neighborhood of, of Z, okay, so then, um, so this AN, ANs of Z are eventually going to lie inside this compact neighborhood, right? And so, this, so you're getting infinitely many points in this compact neighborhood. So, um, so the action is not properly discontinuous, okay? So which way does this prove? So um, in this, uh, so this if and only if, so this must be the, the this direction, right? So kind of, right? Okay. So what about uh, the other direction? So suppose you do start with a Fuchsian group. Why is the action properly discontinuous? So um, for this, um, so, now, so now, suppose gamma is a discrete subgroup, PSL2R. So here, we can consider this map, let's call it psi, from PSL2R to H2. Uh, let, let's call it psi of Z0. So Z0 is some point in the upper half plane. Um, so this map takes matrix A, B, C, D to uh, the point A, Z0, C plus D. So, so this matrix applied to Z0, okay? Um, so the claim is that this sine inverse of k is a compact set, is a closed and bounded set in PSL2R. So if k is compact, so here k um, is a compact set. We want to show that any orbit, right, so this Z0 orbit intersects k at only finitely many points. Okay? So it's enough to show this. Why? Because um, so note that so um, the claim implies that if you look at gamma z not intersection k, so the, so this is nothing but this intersected with gamma. Okay. So if you look at what um, free image of this compact set intersected gamma, okay? So, uh, so this, by the claim, is a compact set, and this is discrete, okay? So if you intersect something which is compact and which is discrete, you get something which is finite. So this, um, so these two imply that, 
So this is finite. Okay, and you're done, right? So that once you prove this claim, then then you're done, right? So how do you show that? So so what's going on? So the proof of claim. Um, so you have to show. Um, So what's the picture? So, so you have the upper half plane. Um, you s uh, so you have some subset K, compact subset, and you let Z0 is somewhere okay, on the upper half plane. You know that you're, you're looking at all the matrices A, B, C, D, so that this image under this linear fractional transformation lands inside K. Okay? And you want to show that that set of matrices is closed and bounded. So these A, B, C, Ds can't be too big, too small. So, um, so, since, so this is a picture. So since K is compact, there are two things that, two um, quantities that get bounded. So, so one is the distance of, is the size of, C, uh, of this, um, of this complex number, which is just the distance from the origin, right? So, of course, this is a compact set. If, you're, if these, all these quantities um, are, are lying inside this compact set, this is better be less than or equal to m1. Okay, so some number, uh, for some number in so some. Okay, so that's one quantity that's bounded. Okay, the another quantity that gets bounded is um, the imaginary part of A Z naught plus B upon C Z naught plus T. Because this being a compact set, it is it's a definite distance away from this boundary. Okay, so it's at some definite height. All points over here it has a minimum height which is which is away from this boundary. And so so this so the imaginary part is definitely bigger than some M2. Okay? And, and these should, should be enough to bound A, B, C, and D. So, um, so remember last time, we kind of we saw that this, what is this? What's the imaginary part of a linear fractional transformation applied to Z? Well, it's the imaginary part of Z0 divided by absolute value of this squared, right? So, I, did people check that? Oh, so. Um, right, so this automatically, this, this sort of bounds the CZ0 plus D, right? It tells you that this is less than some M3 because, because the Z0 is fixed, right? So that's something fixed. And, and if you plug that in over here, so then then you get that A Z0 plus B is also less than M1 times M3, something like this, right? So, you, so this you bring to this side. And so, so these two kind of are enough. I mean, so it tells you that sort of A, B, C, D are, are bounded. Okay, and, and um, yeah, this is a continuous map. So closed is easy, right? I mean, so if the pre-image of a compact set. Okay, so... Um, Right, so this is how the, this claim gets done, and, and you can prove the proper discontinuity, right? Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so and, and we've seen this proper discontinuous action in a couple of cases now, so, um, so if it's a parabolic um, uh, element, you look at the cyclic subgroup generated by, so then the, this action is nice, right, so the orbits, kind of go off to infinity, right? So, so this is one action. And, and what's going to be important for us is that we want to get to uh, sort of these the tiles that are there. So in this picture, if you look at one of these vertical strips, which are bounded by these vertical lines, okay? So that's, that forms a, like a basic tile and then translates of that tile the hyperbolic plane, okay? And, and similarly here, if you are dilating, so I, I kind of erase that. So if the hyperbolic case was where, so the tiles were, 
remember the things were dilating, right? So, um, so each one of these bands, the semicircular sort of half annuli, so these uh, get mapped to the next by the, by the hyperbolic isometry. So these dial the hyperbolic plane, okay? So, so these tiles have a name, so these are called fundamental domains. So let me um, sort of come to that, and that's going to be, um, that's going to be the way that we look at these uh, uh, Fuchsian groups. Okay, so let's see. So what's a fundamental domain? So here, so gamma is some group, subgroup of PSL2R um, that acts properly discontinuously. So it's a Fuchsian group. On H2, um, a closed set, subset of hyperbolic plane, um, is a fundamental group for this action. A fundamental domain for this action, rather. Um, if, okay, well, firstly, these, um, the translates of this closed set tile the hyperbolic plane, right? So, so you, you want to say that the union of gamma applied to F, um, where gamma varies over the entire group, equals H2, okay? So, um, so these, um, these translates of F tile the hyperbolic plane, this is what it means. Um, and secondly, we want uh, these not to overlap, right? So these, uh, the interior of F doesn't intersect um, gamma times, so any translate, okay, the interior of any translate. So this is phi, so this just means that tiles don't overlap. Okay, um, so that's a fundamental domain, and, and so here you can see that that's what happens for these strips. Okay, so these, uh, so um, every point, um, yeah, so if you look at translates of the strip, they definitely cover the hyperbolic plane, and similarly here, um, and they have disjoint interiors. Okay, um, so that's a fundamental domain. What's, um, so first of all, I mean, it's not clear that they exist, but let me first remark that uh, this fundamental domain may not be unique, right? So given an action of gamma, so a fundamental domain um, is not unique. Um, so, for example, here you have these tiles. You can introduce a, a small bump in, let's say, this, this boundary of this closed set F, and, and, and you kind of uh, translate this bump and you get bumps all the way. So this, this new sort of dented kind of closed set is again a fundamental domain. Okay? So it is still satisfies these two. It's a closed set and uh, the it translates cover the plane and the interiors are disjoint. So, so it's certainly not unique, but there's a nice way of constructing in some kind of canonical way a fundamental domain for a Fuchsian group. So let me come to that, and that's going to give us very nice tilings of the hyperbolic plane whenever you have a Fuchsian group. Okay, so, um, so this is called a, a Dirichlet domain. or uh, gamma. So let me sort of give it some notation. So, um, so gamma, as before, is a Fuchsian group, something that acts nicely, properly discontinuously on the plane. So, so definition 
a Dirichlet domain for gamma um, centered at a point P. So you have a choice of a point P is the set. So let me call it TP gamma. So that's the set of all points in the hyperbolic plane, which are a distance so that this is satisfied. So okay, so um, what's the what does this picture look like? What, what does this mean? So this, well, um, so if you look at a P, this, the point P that you've chosen, and gamma of P, so gamma is something in, um, in this Fuchsian group, then the set of points that satisfy this inequality is something like uh, one side of this perpendicular bisector of this geodesic between the two. Okay, so it's, it's, you have a you have the set of points which are at equal distance from P and gamma of P. That's going to be a geodesic line. And the set of points closer to P is, uh, is uh, one of these half spaces. Okay, and, and so basically what this is is the intersection. That's, if you call this half space H subscript P of, of little gamma, it's the intersection of all these half spaces where gamma varies over capital gamma. Okay, so um, so that's going to be um, your set. It's, a, it's clearly a closed and convex set. Okay? So any of these regions, there's a convex set. It's a half space. Yes? Yeah, that, this, is, this is true. Certainly you'll believe that in Euclidean geometry, right? Now in hyperbolic ge geometry, it's a, it's a calculation, but you can, um, yeah, so you can... See that in the upper half plane model, if you want, and and, and yeah, so it's it's yeah. Let me just say it's a calculation for now. Okay, so um, yeah. So what does it look like in the upper half plane? So um, well, you have to sort of figure out what gamma is. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so, so depending on, so now you know the classification of elements. Of, of, uh, so, so you can, for each, you can figure out what the corresponding, so you can put these in some kind of sort of normal position. And, and yeah. So gamma itself is one, is either hyperbolic or parabolic. Or, now, composition of them is again a hyperbolic or parabolic. Yeah, so yeah, you can all you can decompose things into parabolic and hyperbolic, but it itself is one of the three. Right? So, the classification of elements covers all elements. Certainly, it's not as if you know some elements are compositions of basic elements. It's not quite. Uh, yeah, that's not needed. But okay, so yeah, that, this is an exercise. So anyway, so it's a. Uh, it's a closed and convex set, okay? And the claim and the claim is that this is a fundamental domain for the action. So dP gamma is a fundamental domain. For the action of gamma on H2. Okay, what's the proof? Well, you have to check these two properties, which, um, right? So this, this closed set F is now of my Dirichlet domain, right? So, um, well, the first thing to check is that any orbit intersects this Dirichlet domain, right? So if you take uh, an orbit, um, so let Z be some point in H2, then, um, so you want, so what you want is that um, gamma of z intersects this Dirichlet domain um, somewhere, okay? So this is equivalent to this first one, right? So you want to show that, yes. So HP gamma is this region which is on one side of this perpendicular bisector between 
P and gamma P. Okay, so it's a half space. Uh, it's a half plane in the hyperbolic plane, right? It's one side of this geodesic. I left it to you to check that this is indeed a geodesic. It's a set of points for which, uh, yeah, so the geodesic is where equality holds. Uh -huh. So this is HP of gamma. Okay, so that's a set of points where it's closer to P than gamma of P. All right. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so you want to show this. Well, if you, if you take, so since gamma Z is a discrete set, um, so remember we are kind of assuming that gamma is a Fuchsian group. So it acts properly discontinuously. So this is a discrete set, an orbit is discrete. There exists some minimum, uh, so some, some element of the orbit such that um, the distance of Z0 to P is, is the least, okay? So there's uh, is less than distance of, uh, of the other point. So let me just say that uh, uh, equals the infimum over all other points in the orbit um, uh, of Z. Okay, so um, so we have uh, yeah. So so this gamma of Z is some orbit here, and there's some kind of Let's say Z is here, there's some kind of, there's an orbit which is the least distance. There's an uh, element of the orbit which is the least distance from P, okay? And the claim is, and, and then, so by definition, so, um, so what does this mean? This means that this is less than gamma of um, Z naught for all gamma and gamma, and this is, so this is nothing but distance of Z naught from gamma inverse of P. Okay, so if you apply gamma inverse to both sides, I mean, it's, it's distances, of course, it doesn't change. So, so this is nothing but saying that, um, so this Z naught is in this uh, set. Okay, so, um, so this sort of implies that Z naught belongs to the Dirichlet domain. Okay, so, so for every orbit, okay, we have found um, an element Z0 which lies in the Dirichlet domain. Okay, so this means that these translates of the Dirichlet domain in fact uh, cover the whole plane. Okay, so that, check, that sort of verifies the first property. Um, what about the second one? So suppose you have two so you have the Dirichlet domain somewhere. Um, so the Dirichlet domain, let me just sort of, it's just kind of, it's bounded by these geodesic sides, right? So it's going to be polygons. Um, so if you have two points in the same orbit, so this, yeah, so this fo would follow now from the fact that um, that two points, so, so this orbit intersects DP of this Dirichlet domain at exactly one point, okay? So there can't be more than one, all right? So, um, uh, yeah, so, so what happens? So suppose there are uh, more than one points in the interior. So suppose Z1 and Z2, so I want to show that not only does, is this intersection non-empty, this intersection is exactly one point. Okay, so, um, so let me just say that this is in the interior. Yeah. Um, so, so the, once again, this you can uh, you can check. So, suppose you have um, two points in the interior. Suppose Z1 and Z2 are two points in the interior of 
the Dirichlet domain, and that, that lie in the same orbit, uh, and as that, that lie in the same gamma orbit. So then, by definition, we know that this is less than equal to, well, since it's interior, it's strictly less than Z1 of gamma P for all gamma. And, and this is nothing but um, this you can rewrite as this because this the distance between points if you apply an isometry and to, uh, to both this, the distance doesn't change and 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 since um, z1 and z2 the z2 is lies in the same orbit you can choose a gamma so that this is z2 right so in particular um, so this is equal to d z2 p for some gamma okay so um, so you've shown that the distance of z1 to from p is strictly less than the distance of z2 from p but you can interchange the roles of z1 and z2 and that shows that you get a contradiction okay so so interchanging roles of Z1 and Z2, um, you get a contradiction. So uh, same holds with Z1, Z2 swapped. So and that's a contradiction. Okay, so um, so you can't have two elements in the same orbit both inside the fundamental domain. Okay, so this is this tells you that um, translates of the interior are disjoint. Okay, so there can't be two elements um, in the same in the interior of this Dirichlet domain. Okay, so um, so this tells you that uh, the, the Dirichlet domain is indeed the fundamental domain, and you can work out various things now. So now you can view Fuchsian groups in terms of these uh, Dirichlet domains, and these are usually nice polygons. Okay, so, um, so what do you have? So for example, if you look at um, the group PSL2Z, right, that's a kind of, um, that's a Fuchsian group, so you can look at so the Dirichlet domain for a gamma PSL to Z. Okay, so what does that look like? Um, so you can uh, so let me just uh, tell you what it what it is, and can sort of work out the details. Um, so so let's say centered. You have to choose the point at which they're centered. Centered at P equals two I. So this looks following so you have um, you have a picture like this it's going to be so this is a semicircle with centered at zero between minus one and one and these are vertical lines where the real coordinate is minus half and half so two i is somewhere up here Okay, so that's 2i, okay? And, um, and the shaded region is going to be the Dirichlet domain. Okay, so this is, uh, let me just describe it. So let's call it F. So that's the region between, so the real part of Z is between minus half and half. And, um, and you intersect it with the exterior of this semicircle. Okay, so um, so it's this polygonal region, right? It's bounded by these geodesic sides. Okay, and that's what you expect because you're intersecting um, the, these half spaces, okay, each of which are bounded by these geodesics. Okay, um, and 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 here, um, so you, you need to check that this is indeed a, um, a Dirichlet domain because uh, uh, so uh, so the Dirichlet domain by definition it involves 
an inter in principle, a priori, it's an infinite intersection, right? But but it turns out to be finitely many. Yeah. So we can we can translate this to the next day. Yeah. Okay. Fine. All right. Okay. Okay.